Good evening. I'm afraid we must now reconcile ourselves to the fact that we have lost the Mars Observer probe. At the special request of NASA, Professor Andrew Lyne and the Dodgeville Bank team used the Lovell telescope to make a last dish attempt to contact it, but they weren't successful, and if they can't do it, I'm quite sure that nobody else can. On the credit side, the Galileo probe, on its way to Jupiter, has sent back the first close-range picture of the asteroid Ida, which is almost 30 miles long, and like the previous asteroid imaged by Galileo, Gasper, is a rocky cratered body, and quite clearly the fragment of a larger body that broke up. And we also have splendid results from the Hubble Space Telescope. Look at this picture. This is a picture of the nova that flared up last year in Cygnus. It's 10,000 light years away. And there's the Hubble picture of it, showing the shell of material that has developed around it. And that shell is now 40,000 million miles across. And that shows, yet again, that despite its faulty mirror, the Hubble telescope can still outperform any Earth-based telescope. I wonder if you know what this is. It looks rather like a fishing line, but it's not. It's an optical fiber. And if you put a beam of light into one end, that beam will emerge at the other end almost undiminished. And, of course, you can then position it very accurately indeed. The idea goes back to Dr. Roger Angel. He, of course, is in America, and he's developing new mirrors by the spin technique, and he's built the 256-inch mirror to replace the six existing mirrors of the old MMT. His original idea was to use fiber optics to combine the light from 100 2.5-meter telescopes. That didn't actually get off the ground, but by now, fiber optics are becoming very important indeed in modern astronomy. At this stage, I'm delighted to welcome back somebody who's been very much concerned with research, and still is, Dr. Fred Watson of the Royal Greenwich Observatory. Welcome back, Fred. First of all, how do you pass light through a thing as thin as this? Well, you obviously have to aim the beam of light very accurately at the entrance face of the fibre, typically with an accuracy of about one hundredth of a millimetre. Once it's inside the fibre, the light bounces along in a zigzag fashion, being reflected from the walls of the fibre. Um, it, it's a very pure strand of glassy fused silica that, that makes the fibre, and it's the purity of the silica that gives these fibres their low-loss characteristic. We've got a length of fibre here um, whose output end is underneath this TV microscope. And if I uh, shine light down the input end by holding it against this desk lamp, you can probably see on the microscope uh, the light coming through to the output end. There is a pin right next to the fibre, and you can see the fibre lighting up there as I move it next to the pin head one-tenth of a millimeter in diameter. Astronomically, what's the point of it? The thing that astronomers like about fibers is their flexibility as well as their low-loss characteristic. Because the flexibility gives them the possibility of moving around the light from stars, galaxies, or quasars in a controlled manner. Imagine, for example, if you had a giant camera pointing at the sky, which is really all a large telescope is. If instead of putting a film at the place where the image is formed, uh, as you would if you were going to take a photograph, instead of doing that, you arranged a whole series of these fibers so that they were lined up with the stars or galaxies that you're interested in. Then they would intercept and collect the light from those objects, and you could bring them back to a more convenient place. In fact, what you could do is you could line them up in, in a straight line, as, as we see here. This is just perfect for getting the fibers into a spectrograph, which is that indispensable weapon in the astronomer's armory that lets uh, astronomers analyze the faint light from stars and galaxies to reveal hidden vital statistics. Now, the nice thing about a spectrograph is that it would let you look at the spectrum coming down each fiber simultaneously. So instead of having to point your telescope at objects individually to, to obtain their spectra, you can do them all at once. And the net result of this is a huge gain in efficiency. It saves the, the astronomer's most precious commodity, which is telescope time. Yes, I see that. Well, how do you go about it? The technique was first implemented by um, a postgraduate student of Roger Angel's, one John Hill yes. of the University of Arizona. He built a fiber optics system which he christened Medusa 
for the Steward Observatory 2.3 meter telescope at Kitt Peak near Tucson. Um, this telescope is actually a Cassegrain telescope. The image is formed through a hole in the main mirror. And at the focal plane, the place where the image is formed, John Hill placed an aluminium plate into which he drilled holes very accurately corresponding to the positions of the target objects, in this case they were galaxies, that he was interested in. And into those holes he inserted short lengths of fiber and ran the fibers back again to a slit uh, on the entrance of a spectrograph. So the light passed down through the aluminium plate, through the fibers and into the spectrograph where it generated a whole series of spectra, uh, one neatly stacked on top of the other one. These can then be detected by a CCD camera, that uh, very sensitive type of detector that, that astronomers uh, use so much these days. Of course, you can use this technique also on really large telescopes. That's correct. And during the 1980s, there was uh, a fair bit of interest from a handful of four-meter class telescopes, most particularly, I think, from the 3.9-meter Anglo-Australian telescope in New South Wales. There, a, a young engineer by the name of Peter Gray uh, in the early 1980s took hold of this technique and perhaps more than anybody else at that time transformed it from being um, a simple experiment into a frontline astronomical tool. And certainly during the 1980s, the AAT's uh, productivity, if you like, went up hugely because of fiber optics. Peter Gray developed a system called FOCAP uh, in which he fitted the end of each fiber with a small brass ferrule, which allowed you to plug them into a plate and when you finish with the plate, take them out again and reuse the fibers. Uh, it's called the plug plate technique, as you might guess from the, from the idea. And I've got one here, a plug plate from the Anglo-Australian telescope. You can see that it's simply a large brass plate. Um, in use, the images of the galaxies will be formed by the telescope on this position, but it's drilled with very accurately positioned holes. If we light it up from behind, you can see mm. these holes showing very clearly. And into the holes are plugged the fibers. Um, once the, the plug plate with its fibers in is in the telescope and pointed at the sky, then as if by magic, the fibers illuminate on the, on the output end of the slit when you get the telescope pointing at the right area of sky, just as we see in this demonstration. Well, the principles go enough, but have there been any major developments since then? Yes, there have. One of the drawbacks of the plug plate technique, of course, is that each time you make a new, uh, you want to observe a new bit of sky, you have to drill a new plug plate. And um, so people have looked at the possibility of using computers to help them. Uh, in fact, again, it was Roger Angel's group in America who built the first computer-driven fiber positioner to dispense with a plug plate. They called it MX uh, in parody of the uh, Cold War <laughs> ballistic missile system. Yeah. MX consisted of a series of actuators arranged around the focal plane, just like fishermen with their rods around a pond. And the computer could un instruct these actuators where to go to intercept the light from the target objects. Now, MX was very successful, but the problem is that because it had 32 actuators, because it used 32 fibers, it was actually very expensive to build. And if you wanted to build one for 100 fibers, then you would be talking about prohibit mm. prohibitively high costs. These thoughts led uh, Dr. Ian Parry of the University of Durham, um, together with Peter Gray again, to build a system which they called Autofib. Autofib is a fiber positioner that works in a different way. Imagine the input end of each fiber being fitted with a tiny right-angled prism to deflect the light into it. Um, here's one of the prisms next to the head of a pin to show you the sort of scale we're talking about. Um, and then imagine this little assembly with a magnet fixed underneath it so that it would stick on a metal plate and remain where it was placed. And the idea is to be able to place the fibers on this metal plate um, very accurately by means of a robot positioner.
The prisms then intercept the light from the target object and send it down the fibers to the spectrograph as we saw before. And we can demonstrate here how the, how the fiber positioner works. Um, we have a, a group of six fibers. In reality, there are many more. Yeah. And here is a, a human robot in this case moving them uh, as it would to position them in alignment with target objects. Um, the robot, in fact, is, is a very clever device. It, it has to have intelligence so that it knows when it has put a fibre down in the right place. Well, looking at this thing, there must be plenty of difficulties involved. Yes, there are. Um, one of the problems with the robot, uh, as well as the one I've mentioned, is that it has to be able to move very quickly because it's got to rearrange all the fibres um, as quickly as possible, unlike MX, which does them all at once. But the great beauty is that you're only building one robot, and so you can afford to make it as sophisticated as you like. Uh, the first autofib was built for the Anglo-Australian telescope in 1987 uh, and has been in use there ever since. And there's a nice picture here showing uh, the fibres arranged in the shape of a map of Australia, minus Tasmania, I'm afraid. It was pretty about Tasmania. Yes. But Fred, <laughs> you were out in Australia for some time and you were working there with the UK Schmidt, United Kingdom Schmidt. And I imagine you used fibre optics on that. Well, we did, yes. Back in 1982, we realised that... Um, as, as well as the size of the mirror of a telescope, its field of view is very important for multi-fiber spectroscopy. That's to say the area of sky that it can see in any one time. And this is um, important for the Schmidt because whilst the Schmidt telescope is a relatively small instrument, it has an enormous field of view. In fact, it's normally used for taking photographs of the southern sky, um, rather like this one. This is a a negative photograph taken by the UK Schmidt telescope. It's actually of the South Galactic Pole, in which you can see dark images on a white background because it's a negative. Yes. We had to build a system that would be interchangeable with the, the photography project because that still is ongoing. And we built an instrument called Flare, which uses 92 fibers, up a tenth of a millimeter in diameter, again fitted with tiny prisms and positioned by a sort of manual version of autofib which uh, we actually christened Autofred for some reason. I wonder why. <laughs> um, and Autofred positions the fibres in much the same way as the automatic one does. Flare was the world's first wide field fibre optic system, but it also pioneered another aspect of the technique um, that has been since followed on a, on a number of larger telescopes. And that is that instead of using short lengths of fibre to couple the focal plane of the telescope to the spectrograph, and have the spectrograph riding on the telescope, which allows it to bend um, it, and, and flex in a, in a way that you yeah. don't want. We, we made the fibers very long and connected them to a spectrograph that was placed on a table in the dome. So the spectrograph remains fixed in position where it is very, very stable. Well, clearly, there's a tremendous amount to be learned from this kind of technique. What are the most important results from it so far? Well, the, the main use of the technique is to gather large amounts of data that would be useful for statistical purposes, um, where you need to measure many objects and gather data that you per perhaps would be dif not only difficult, but impossible to, to gather in any other way. Um, let me describe a, a project that's been carried out with Flare. Um, this has been done by Tom Shanks and Alison Broadbent of the University, Durham, uh, University of Durham, together with uh, Paddy Oates, Quentin Parker and myself from the Royal Observatories. And we're interested in mapping the positions of galaxies in the local part of our universe to see whether they are uh, distributed uniformly or clumped together or strung out in long filaments because these have important bearings on theories of the uh, origin of the Big Bang, the event in which our universe was created. What flare gives us when we use it uh, to, to, to look at these galaxies are images which contain spectra. Now you can see one here on the screen. Each of these horizontal lines is actually the spectrum of a galaxy spread out in, into its component colors. It would have, if you could see it in color, it would have orange on one side and deep red on the other. But look at these features on the right hand side. These are features that have their origin in the galaxies themselves. They're what are called emission lines. And you can see they're staggered relative to one another. They're not all in the same place in the spectrum. And this is because the galaxies have differing redshifts. From an image like this, we can actually measure the redshift. And we can, um, by measuring the redshift, we can calculate the distance of the galaxy and hence 
plot its position on a sort of three-dimensional map of our part of the universe. And here's some, some of the results uh, in the form of a map with the Earth at this sort of apex and a wide angle of view um, showing where the galaxies are distributed. And you can see that they indeed do seem to clump together rather than being uniform. Well, that's one major result of fiber optics. I'm sure there are going to be plenty of others. So what do you think comes next in this particular field of research? Well, the tendency now is to uh, f almost to follow flare with these large four meter class telescopes and to place the fiber optic system not at the Cassegrain focus as has happened hitherto, but actually at the prime focus which means that the light is simply imaged back from the main mirror. You need to put some correcting lenses in at the prime focus to give sensible images. Um, but in doing that, you can make for a, a relatively wide field. Now, on the 4.2-meter William Herschel telescope in La Palma, uh, we at the Royal Observatory, at Royal Greenwich Observatory, together with uh, colleagues from the University of Durham, are building a one-degree field system, which will use a machine called Autofib2 to position 126 fibers, and they then lead down from the prime focus to a spectrograph which is mounted on the base of the telescope, uh, which is called WIFOS for Wide Field Fiber Optic Spectrograph. At the Anglo-Australian telescope, they're uh, doing one better. They're actually building a two-degree field system, which is called 2DF, or two-degree field. That needs a large correcting lens to make it work, and here's a picture of its designer, Damien Jones, standing beside the corrector before it is mounted onto the top end of the telescope where it is normally operated. They are using a kind of double-barreled autofib that uses two separate lots of fibers so that whilst one array of fibers is being positioned by the robot, the other is actually looking at the sky through the telescope. And they will feed 400 fibers to two separate spectrographs simultaneously. There's really no limit to it, is there? Not at all. And by probably by 1995, these two instruments will be bringing back huge quantities of very exciting new data. Well, you know, of all the modern techniques, this, I think, is one of the most extraordinary. A little thing like this, an immensely thin optical fiber, and light can pass through that and can tell us information about systems so far away that their light takes thousands of millions of years to reach us. It just shows how far we've come in the last few years. Fred, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. And don't forget, if you want the latest astronomical information, then um, dial up the Sky at Night information line, and the number is 0891. 800330, 36 pence per minute cheap rate, and 48 pence per minute at other times. Also, it is now newsletter time. And if you want the newsletter, then send your stamp to envelope to newsletter number 51, The Sky at Night, <coughs> BBC TV, London W12 7RJ. And of course, you can also look at CFAX, page 685. When I come back next month, we are not going to be in the studio at all. We're going to go on a trip to Somerset. We're going to go down to Taunton School, and there we're going to look at their very own radio telescope. And so, until next month, good night. <laughs>